Hey everybody, this is Joe from the F-Stops here, and today we're talking about the Nikon Z5. This is gonna be a really popular camera for people who are migrating into mirrorless and want to go mirrorless full frame, who are going from mirrored Nikon and going into an entry point in uh, mirrorless full frame, people wanting to just get into the Nikon S mount, uh, this is gonna be a good option for them. And I wanna do some videos on using this camera. So today we're gonna to take a look at the quick menu. Now that's gonna be the I button on the back of the camera that brings up 12 commonly changed items. And in later videos, we will take a look at the shooting full menu, the video menu, and the custom settings menu so that we can have a really good foundation in operating this camera. So without further ado, let's jump into the quick menu. So we are just set up to be able to shoot a picture here and we're gonna take a look at the quick menu, which we access by pressing the I button, which is above the four-way control pad. And when we do so, we are going to pull up uh, the quick menu or the I menu, which is the 12 most commonly changed items that uh, we have access to while shooting, or at least it's Nikon's prediction of the 12 most commonly changed items. I would disagree with several of these. And uh, in a later video, I'm gonna take a look at the full shooting menu of the camera. And I very well might have some ideas inside of there of things that would be more useful to have in the quick menu. Because remember, these are the things that we would change more often. And some of them are probably not going to be changed as often as others. But anyway, we'll get to that as we get to it. Right now, I wanna go through each option in turn, all right, and we're going to start with set picture control. So picture control is the processing of the sharpening, the contrast, the saturation, the hue of the image as you are shooting it. And please note that I am set up for raw image quality right now, meaning that these will work when shooting raw pictures. They are not just for JPEGs. Now I've got some opinions about some of them being made more specifically for JPEG shooting, and some of them being made, being made more specifically for raw shooting, but we'll get into that. So uh, to be able to navigate, I can simply highlight over the option that I want, press the OK button, and it will take me inside of the quick menu option. And then, and I'll go through navigation with this first option, but just know it's gonna be similar with all other options in the camera. I can press left or right to be able to navigate where I wanna go. If I wanna move back to the quick menu, I can press I. If I wanna make a selection, I press okay. And if I want to adjust a setting and the settings preset, I can press the down button, which says adjust at the bottom of the page, which is great. So I'm gonna come over to the very first option over here, which is auto which is going to do a little bit of added enhancement with every single picture. But because it is auto, it might fluctuate the amount of adjustment on a picture for picture basis. Now this might mean that we get options or enhancements that are more tailored to an image out of camera, but it will be different. And that means we can't batch edit images effectively in post-production. And so use this if you're not doing any sort of a batch edit with imagery, but just know that we do have that downside. Now, more often when people are using a picture control, they're using standard, which is a little bit of added contrast with every single image. And it's a set small amount, which means that it is the same throughout all of them. So this is a very common way to set up your shooting. Uh, and I would make the argument as we take a look here that if you are shooting JPEG images in camera, which I would advise against, we'll get to that, but if you are, auto, standard, and vivid, and portrait and landscape are gonna be the ones most useful for you. Um, they are not particularly useful for raw shooters because those are things we have such easy control over in post-production. For those of us shooting raw, neutral, uh, and flat are probably the ways we would shoot the majority of images in camera because these give us a wider dynamic range at the moment of capture, which gives us more latitude in editing later on, though the images do not look as good out of camera. Now there are six pages of these and the majority of them are some really fun uh, enhancements that give a mood or an atmosphere. I actually think that they're really fun to shoot even for a raw 
shooter because they get you thinking and imagining of a specific effect. But please know that if you are shooting raw imagery, there is nothing presented here you could not reproduce in post-production. And so most of the time, we'd just be shooting a neutral or a flat uh, effect. Uh, but I do think that viewing your images while shooting in monochrome or in some kind of particular effect gets you framing things differently, gets you photographing things differently because of the atmosphere being produced. So they can be useful. That said, neutral gives you no additional contrast or saturation or hue shift, but it does do a little bit of added sharpening. Coming over to uh, Vivid, this is adding saturation to the image. This is our most highly saturated of the options. When people are shooting JPEGs and want to really boost color, this is the direction that they tend to go. Monochrome, this is a very nice monochrome. It's a nice, rich, even monochrome that does not boost contrast too much. We do have some monochrome options later that are much more contrasty, uh, but this one here is very, uh, very subdued, and it's a, it's a rich and nice monochrome. It actually looks quite good. Coming to the next page, we have, and like I said, these ones are, for me, more for portraiture shooting. We have the, uh, or JPEG shooting. The portrait one attempts to boost some vibrance without affecting skin tone, but we're going to get more contrast and we're gonna get more saturation out of landscape because it's assuming we probably don't have dramatic amounts of skin tone inside of the image. The flat option here is different than neutral. Neutral still adds a little bit of sharpening, but nothing else. Flat gives you nothing. So it really is a very gray flat image out of camera, but that gives you a ton of editing capacity later, which is nice. Now I'm not gonna describe each one of the next series individually, just know that they are some really fun and interesting options. I'm at least take a look at them. Uh, some particular favorites as I go through these, um, I actually quite like uh, one coming up here, the somber effect, I think it's quite fun. Um, uh, silence is a very desaturated one, and desaturated imagery can be really fun to work with. Um, I've actually particularly like, I think denim's actually quite a fun one to, to see and to experience. Classic CP, of course, had to be in here. Uh, because it's such a common effect that people want to reproduce. We have some standard color options, and then we get some really contrasty black and white options here with our carbon and our charcoal. Now please note, in a later video, I'm gonna take a look at the full shooting menu of the camera, and you can actually create new presets that will be added into the quick menu into these additional boxes. So you can actually create new ones that you might use more often, which is an awesome feature of the Z5. That's just not something we do in the quick menu, so I won't be covering that right now. Now I do wanna take a look at adjusting these because you'll notice that with any of them, I can press the down arrow to adjust and you can change these presets to do whatever you want them to do. So if you want to use standard or vivid, but you want to tweak it a little bit, you can do so. So just come into it and press the down button on the four way control pad. And now we're going to get our ability to adjust, in this case, the standard picture uh, control. And notice that right now we have four of these boxes highlighted in a yellow outline, the zero quick, and then something that says plus three, plus two, and plus one. So what are those? So you have right now what's called quick sharp or a quick sharpening tool, which is a batch of sharpening options that adjust in kind or together. So this is option zero. Then you get a plus one, a plus two, etc. And there are three sharpening tools that are inside of here. One of them is just standard sharpening. Sharpening is a micro contrast that happens at the edge of subjects. So it's at the edge of one subject, beginning of another, beginning of the background, not a contrast that moves all the way through the image as in inside of a subject. It's trying to highlight the separation or the difference between parts of the frame and other parts. You have the full sharpening, then you have mid-tone sharpening or mid-range sharpening. And that's going to just be the mid-range exposure objects being sharpened in this way, not your highlights and shadows. And then you get clarity, which is finite detail sharpening. And so you can adjust all of these in kind with this quick sharp 
option, so softer or sharper, which is a really nice tool. But just to scroll down to show you that we can adjust these, I'm going to move down. Here's mid-range sharpening, which is at a plus two, but I can just take this and adjust it. I can go up to standard sharpening, and you'll notice I moved it to a plus four. And as soon as I did, the yellow outline went away, and the zero in zero quick went to gray, because I have adjusted that standard quick sharpening tool. All right, which is fine. I can do that. It's no big deal. Um, and I can move these to wherever I feel that I want them. All right, so sharpening itself is the entirety of the frame. Mid range is going to be just those mid tones and not highlights and shadows. And clarity is finite detail. So uh, those are attempting to isolate the subject more than the environment. And you're seeing we can come in and adjust these however we see fit, just through left and right scrolling on the control pad. Now, Sharpening tools are at the edge of subjects, which means that they are differentiated from contrast, even though they are micro contrast adjustments. Contrast itself is the entirety of the frame, and so it is the difference of brightness and darkness, right? Bright things get brighter, dark things get darker when we add contrast. And most imagery, particularly if you, particularly if you shoot flat or neutral, wants to have boosted contrast. This is something I call stretching the histogram because you get more, uh, more variety of tones throughout an image, so more bright areas, dark areas, and hopefully still a good amount of mid-range, rather than having things really bunch up in the center of a histogram, which we refer to as being tonal. So adding a little bit of contrast, whether it's here or in post, is very useful. When we get to brightness, this is taking the image after being shot and adding some brightness or darkening it uh, in post, which can be a nice way to take images as you see them coming out of camera and just pushing them or pulling them back. A little bit. Most of the time people are taking images and brightening them a little bit. Um, there are a couple reasons for that. Uh, specifically you might be trying to make your exposure uh, control for highlights better and so you don't want to make it too bright at the moment of capture in order to maintain those highlight uh, details. Very common way to shoot. Now saturation is the depth of color. So blues get more blue, yellows get more yellow. And very common to add saturation, particularly to landscape imagery or, or other imagery that has a whole lot of non-human skin tone richness to it. Please note that saturation affects all color. In photo editing, you'll see something called vibrance, which attempts to boost the color depth without affecting human skin tone and areas that are already highly saturated. And that takes more processing power, which is why you get a saturation effect inside, inside of cameras, and you get saturation or vibrance in post-production editing. It's just a, a difference in CPU power, effectively. But saturation can be really nice for some effects and some subject matter that you are shooting. Now there is a second page here. If we scroll down, we're going to get hue, and this is the shifting of the actual color. So we can move this in very small increments to shift the way that color manifests uh, to warmer tones, to cooler tones, shifting around the color wheel effectively. Once we hit OK, we save it, and we have effectively adjusted whatever uh, picture control we are looking at. So. Uh, quite a nice way to be able to adjust the way camera imagery uh, is produced in camera, which is great. Our next option over here is going to be image quality. So let's take a second and talk about this. Um, the goal, I would argue, for anybody picking up a camera is to, as soon as you're able to, take this. It comes out of the box set to JPEG. Take it out of JPEG, move to RAW as fast as possible. There is six-fold as much information in a RAW file as a JPEG file. And so your ability to really finalize and uh, enhance and perfect an image is really only possible in post-production when you have a raw file to work with. You get nearly no editing latitude with a JPEG. So we'd go into here to be able to adjust this. So let's take a look at, at the options. Raw never gets compressed. Well, it technically can, but that's inside of the shooting menu. Uh, and it doesn't change in resolution, as we'll look at later on in this video. So a JPEG can change in resolution and can change dramatically in compression. And that's what those options fine, normal, and basic are. And those are different amounts of compression of the data. 
and then a star indicates less compression in that option range. So we have six options in JPEG compression here in fine, normal, and basic with and without stars. When we have these options up here that go to raw plus F or raw plus F star, that's a raw version of the image and a JPEG version that is saved. And the JPEG, we get compression options. So that's what the raw plus JPEG options are there. Um, I don't see, you have to convince me and really work hard to convince me that you have a use for JPEG images uh, because maybe you're shooting and you need to deliver small versions of images to clients. Sure, okay, I get that. Uh, but realistically, uh, you do not unlock the full capacity of what this camera can do with a JPEG image. It can do so much more when you are shooting a RAW file which is important. So that, that would be important. The only time that I would say, hey, don't switch to a RAW file right away if you've just got your Z5, is if you don't have a photo editing software to work with right now. Um, you want your photo editing software to be something that can organize, import, edit, and create export variants. Uh, the two most common are Capture One and Lightroom. Uh, if you decide to use Capture One, I've got a number of videos on this channel on Capture One. Uh, it's something I make a lot of videos about to help people out with that software. So if you're using Capture One, check those out. All right, uh, over here is flash mode. So you'll notice that there is no pop-up flash on the Z5, right? It doesn't exist. Uh, and that's to make the camera more weather sealed. But as soon as you put a flash onto the hot shoe, this is gonna give us options. Now this first one here, is flash off. So it's the little lightning bolt with an arrow symbol, that means flash, with a line through it, so flash off, because of course there's no flash. If you have a flash on the camera, but you go to this option, the flash won't fire. Now, this first one uh, at the far left is fill flash. This just means that the flash fires. This should be your default for your flash options, okay? The next one over is going to be red eye reduction, which is honestly um, a little bit of a gimmick, uh, here with an interchangeable lens camera without a pop-up flash, but let me tell you what I mean by that. So red eye reduction flash strobes the flash before taking the picture, right? That's, that's what it is and how it operates. And that is done so that that, that strobing of the flash restricts the, or constricts the, the pupil of the eye of your subject. And that makes red eye less likely to happen. Red eye is when the light from a flash reflects off the blood at the back of the retina and reflects back into the lens. Now, the closer that a flash is to the lens, the more that they're on axis with each other, the more likely this is to happen. So it's a real problem with point and shoot cameras and cell phones, right? But if you have an auxiliary flash, which sits higher above the lens, it is less and less and less likely. And with a camera without a pop-up flash, that's why I say that this is kind of a meaningless feature. But I suppose it technically could happen, so they give it to you here, and that's what it does. Now next over is going to be slow sync flash. Here's what this is. When you have the camera deciding the exposure and you're using a flash, it typically will take your shutter speed and make it faster. There are technical reasons why this is preferred. Uh, but if you're using a flash and the shutter speed goes really fast, anything that the flash does not reach and touch gets really dark. If you've ever shot a picture in, inside with a flash and the background turned totally black, you know what I'm talking about. So slow sync is going to uh, slow down the shutter speed in order to give you more exposure in the background environment. And then you're adding flash on top of that. So really, really useful in darker interior spaces where you want to see more of the environment. Now this next option just combines the last two. It is a slow sync with red eye. So if you're shooting like at a wedding reception, dark room, you wanna see the dark room, and you wanna make sure that you don't record red eye, this might be useful for you. Now the last option is rear curtain sync. Here's what this is. So uh, there are two physical pieces to your shutter mechanism. The front or the first curtain and the rear or the second curtain. And one, the first one opens, you start shooting a picture, and then the mechanism closes by bringing up and closing with the rear curtain, then they reset. Normally, when you shoot a photograph, the camera 
uh, has the flash fire at the beginning of the shot. In other words, in conjunction with the first curtain. And then the exposure happens and the second curtain closes and you're fine and it's no big deal. You can set the camera so that the flash syncs with the end of the exposure. In other words, with the closing of the rear or the second curtain. Now, why would you do that? If you have something moving in the frame and you want to have that subject lit at the end of the exposure because it's moving towards you, you would use rear curtain sync. So imagine a kid with sparklers. If you used front curtain sync and she's walking towards the camera, then you would have her lit farther away and the light from the sparklers would be moving towards the camera. If you used rear curtain sync, you would you would record and expose her when she's closer to the camera, which is what you would want, and the light from the sparklers would be moving farther away. So that's rear curtain sync. It's actually a very underused flash feature these days, but it's actually quite fun and useful. Highly recommended. Uh, for those situations where it's called for, of course. Now over here is wireless connection. This is not a video about connecting the Wi-Fi option of SnapBridge with the Z5. I might do a video like that. Uh, but the Wi-Fi connection here is just going into and making sure that you turn on and establish the connection with your smart device. Um, that's what it is. It uses SnapBridge. Might do a video on doing that connection uh, in addition to other stuff, but that's where we turn that on so that you don't have to go into the full menu to do so. Over here is release mode. This is also sometimes called drive mode in other cameras. And this is just asking what happens when you push down the shutter release button to take pictures. So single frame is S, a low burst mode is L, a high burst mode is H. Now one thing you might have noticed is we can either here, and I won't do it here because I'm going to do it in another video, uh, adjust how many pictures you get in a low continuous burst, right? It can be two, three, or four, I believe. And you're getting about five frames a second with continuous high. High is always gonna be the fastest that the camera can do. Low is gonna be some number in between. And so we might keep that medium or even on the low side, because if I'm doing maybe portraits, I don't need a ton of them, but I might wanna hold down the shutter release button and get several. With high, it's just gonna be the highest burst that the camera's able to do. Now over here, we're gonna to get to our timer. We can go into details by pressing down and we can adjust how long the self timer goes before we shoot the picture, two, five, 10 or 20 seconds. You might do two seconds because you want to um, uh, just shoot a picture and not have you touching the shutter release button shake the camera. So when people are doing long exposure shots at night, this is very common, okay? But if you're trying to take the picture and then run and get into the frame, like a family picture, then you might need 10 or 20 seconds. Now the option down below here is number of shots. So that's how many pictures you get when the self-delay timer goes off. If you're doing a family or group picture, you wanna set this to somewhere between three and seven photos. And we do that because if you're doing that group photo, we all know that very first shot, someone's eyes are gonna be closed. So you set it to a higher number and one of them inside of the sequence will be the right one. That way you don't have to keep running back and forth. That's what number of shots does for you. Really, really useful feature. Okay, now let's talk about focusing. And please know that when we are focusing, the options presented change if we're in AFS mode or AFC mode. Okay, so we're gonna take a look here. Um, and this is basically how the camera determines what to pull focus on. Now we start with single autofocus point here. And we're in autofocus continuous, as you can see. And I have this small box and I can move it around and wherever I place it, when I decide to pull focus, it pulls focus there. The next option is dynamic area. And let me show you what this is, because it's actually a really useful feature, and I would prefer using this in many situations over single autofocus point. It gives us the same box, but now gives us these eight little dots around it. Here's what that is. If I move my autofocus box over a subject, but there's no contrast inside of that box, it can't see well enough to know what's going on, it can't pull focus. 
if I was in single autofocus mode, well, then that would be a problem because it just couldn't pull focus and it would fail. But in dynamic, it's going to be able to move. It's going to be able to say, all right, I can't find anything here. And it's going to reach outward to these extra dots and use one of them to pull focus. So it can expand its search outward to find something that has contrast where it could pull focus. This is useful, right? So I really like this feature and I think that using it most of the time would be preferable. Now, if you don't know where a subject is going to be, we can go to a wide area, which is great. So this is wide area, small. So it's this box and it's going to look for a subject only inside of this area. So if I don't know exactly where my subject is, but I know the general area, then I could use one of these wide options. There's two sizes, small and large. So if I have less of an idea of where the subject is likely to be, then I'll use the large area. So the larger the area that I'm uh, allowing the camera to search inside of, the less control I have but it's gonna find something to focus on, right? And so the more that I can predict where the subject is, the smaller of a focusing area I want to use. But if you don't know, you don't know. So we can use a larger area like this, which is great. Now the last option is this auto area AF, which gives the entire viewable area that has face detection focusing points in it. And it's going to determine for you where it believes your subject is and you're gonna see it highlight boxes around when it is finding a subject, like you're seeing there when I push down the shutter release button. So I'm gonna change my focusing mode from AFC, which is autofocus continuous. In autofocus continuous, so long as I'm holding that shutter release button down, it's going to constantly focus, right? If I go to AFS, I can push down the shutter release button or my focusing button and hold it and it will lock focus. And our options are going to be slightly different. I'm gonna come in here, you'll notice I have, instead of a dynamic area, I now have the single autofocus point and I have pin. Pin is too small for continuous autofocus to operate with it, but it's this very small box that you're seeing. This is great for finding the exact point where I want to pull focus. I think this is most useful in macro photography where we need to be really specific about where we pull focus. So please note that's also some of the choices in AFS for non-moving subjects, AFC for moving subjects, which is great. Now we also have the other options that we've seen before. So the single autofocus point is going to be inside of here. We'll have the wide areas, small and large, and our auto area, which is going to determine where it believes our appropriate subject is for us. And that's how that works, which uh, gives you a lot of options in finding the appropriate subject. So AFS, non-moving subjects, AFC, moving subjects. MF is manual focus, so that's moving the manual focus ring of the lens to pull focus appropriately. So there are some options in the shooting menu called focus peaking and manual focus assist, which make manual focus more useful. I explore those uh, in a later video where we'll be talking about the shooting menu of the Z5. So note that we can make manual focus really, really convenient to use. All right, over here is white balance. And white balance is adjusting for the color temperature of light. All right, so it's the color of light that we have and the camera adjusting so that colors look appropriate given the color that we have. And we can adjust the way that the camera operates inside of these parameters. So we do have a details option here and you're gonna see me utilize that here in a second. So let's go ahead and go in and we have some auto and then we have a natural light auto. Well, what the heck's the difference there? So we're gonna take a look at them, but the basic idea is that the straight auto is trying to find a true neutral white and gray, where a natural light auto is going to default to having warmer tones because it's assuming sunlight is going to be the light source. And those are slightly different ways of processing for the environment. Uh, and we actually have options inside of auto that change depending on the way that we want to work with warm tones. So we can actually reduce warm tones, right? We can have a true neutral, right? That's going to be our A1. And then we can actually attempt to just keep warm lighting colors 
that we're inside of. So there's a very small difference really between the white balance A2 and the daylight auto those, because they're both trying to keep warm tones. Uh, and they're all adjustable as well as we're going to take a look at here. So if I press that adjust or details button, I get this four-way graph. If I move around my kind of target essentially, then I can shift the way that the camera is trying to process. B and A are going from warm to cool tones, right? So that's your Kelvin adjustment. G and M is green and magenta. That's called tent. And that's going to adjust the uh, overall way that color looks uh, in green and magenta uh, uh, shifts. And I very rarely adjust these, but you can make the camera uh, create an auto, especially with an auto, that manifests slightly cooler or slightly warmer depending on your preferences. And the natural light auto is separated in order to indicate we are expecting you to use this in sunlight conditions. But all of these have the ability to do that exact same adjustment. The only exception to the way that this looks is going to be the Kelvin selection option, which is coming up later on. So we'll get to that. But we might use the natural light auto initially for outside shooting, but um, I probably am not going to use it very much because auto indicates that it can shift the way that it adjusts on a picture for picture basis, which means that there's no consistency in my color. Direct sunlight I use all the time because it's just telling the camera I'm in daylight conditions and it's going to give me the same color profile throughout my series of images, which I think is more useful. I like that consistency. And then we have our standard in lighting environmental options here, which I'm using these first three all the time, which is direct sunlight, cloudy day, and then shade is this last one. Coming to the next page, we have incandescent, but then we have fluorescence over here, and fluorescence come in a huge variety. If there was any of these where I would really adjust the preset, it would be fluorescence because there are so many varieties. In fact, there are two pages of these uh, because there are so many types of fluorescence. So sodium vapors, uh, warm white fluorescence, and a variety of other ones. And we can go in and adjust any of these. So if you're inside of a fluorescent lighting environment, you really want to take a second to see if any of these really fit and maybe go into the adjustment panel to get your color temperature accurate. It can be really worth doing. And the only time in fluorescence when I wouldn't use this is if I was going to do one of the measurement white balances, which I'm going to show you how to do here in a second. But let's come back uh, to here. We have flash. By the way, flash as a white balance option is actually very similar to daylight because flashes are made to attempt to mix into daylight appropriately. And so sometimes I'll be shooting with a flash and I'll just be in daylight mode and that works just fine as well. So K stands for Kelvin and this is choosing the actual color temperature. And this is the only one where that four quadrant is broken out differently from each other because we have more finite control here than we do uh, with the four quadrant graph. I can move my Kelvin, which is the yellow to blue shift. I can move it in 10 degree increments, which is an incredibly small amount of uh, incrementation to be able to move. So 10 degrees, you notice, doesn't do very much. I'm going to come over to the thousands unit, and that's going to change things dramatically. So 8,000 Kelvin is a very cool color temperature. So please note that when I select 8,000, it gets warmer because it is correcting for a cool color temperature. That is different than the way the four quadrant graph uh, works, which is telling you, which is you telling the camera what color to attempt to reproduce. Those are different, right? So this this is slightly different, and knowing how it works is great. But I got to tell you, I'm not using this almost ever, and the reason is it's way easier to do a measurement. I'm going to show you how to do that next. But coming here to green and magenta, I can do that same shift, making the image more green or making it more magenta. So really. That Kelvin one's the only one that kind of works backwards from the way you might expect. All right, so preset manual is an actual measurement. Okay, so I can come through. They're always these have always been labeled as a D, and we get several of them. But I want you to notice something here. We have several different registers, essentially D1, D2, D3, where we can save a measurement. If you come back to the same environment again and again and again, you want to measure it, and we use something called an 18% gray card or cloth available at your local camera store 
and these will give you an exact measurement. Please note that 18% gray is a specific color, all right? And that's really important, that it is a specific color. And if we just try to measure off of any old gray, we don't know if it's polluted with greens or magentas or whatever, and it may not be perfectly accurate. An actual 18% gray tool uh, is going to be uh, is going to be accurate because it's made to be understood by software and cameras. Anyway, if we press OK, we go into the measurement mode for these. And that's where we can actually uh, measure, and we're in, I believe, D1 right now. And so I'm laying a, an 18% gray cloth in front of the camera so that I can measure it. So this is a, a standard known tone for the camera. I'm gonna press OK to go to measurement. I'm gonna press OK to measure. And watch what happens, as soon as I do, did you see the color shift there? It knows what that should look like and it corrected for it. And so measuring an 18% gray card is going to actually be the most accurate white balance you can record in the moment. If you were just taking a picture of the 18% gray cloth uh, and you did a color picker in software, it would work the exact same way, no problem. But that's how we save a measurement into a register. Okay, let's come to image size. You'll notice it's grayed out right now. It's grayed out because we're in raw image quality and you can't change the image size of raw files. They will always be really big, right? Uh, they're gonna be full resolution. So I'm gonna come into image quality real fast and add this as a JPEG. And now I can come into the JPEG and I can choose large, medium, or small, which is 24, 12, and six million pixels respectively. Um, if you're delivering small versions of JPEGs to clients, then you might have them be small, which makes a lot of sense. But if you're shooting raw, you just won't really touch this option. The next menu option we're gonna take a look at over here is metering. So this is how your camera evaluates light. The question before us uh, is what areas of the frame the camera will take into consideration when it is building an exposure. So we have four major options here, and these are for purposes of building an exposure, like I said. So if you are in aperture priority, let's say, the question is what shutter speed does the camera select for you? And it makes that decision on the shutter speed selection based off of the metering mode. So matrix metering is a full screen evaluative metering. It takes all parts of the viewable area of the frame into consideration, but it does give some, uh, some emphasis to the point of focus. The next option over is going to be center weighted metering. And this is going to be uh, priority given to the center 25% of the frame and less priority given to the surrounding 75% of the frame. We might use evaluative metering for landscapes and we might use center weighted for portraiture because we tend to put subjects in the middle of the frame for portraiture. The next option over is going to be spot metering, and this is giving high priority to the point of focus. And when you have heavily backlit subjects, when you have subjects surrounded by a really dark environments, very tricky lighting situations, spot metering can be very helpful because it is going to give priority to your point of focus and attempt to ignore the environment around it. Our last option is the least often used, and that is highlight weighted metering. Here's the idea. You saw the image get very dark as soon as I selected this. Highlight weighted metering is a spot metering, but it assumes that the point being metered is the highlight, not the midtone of the frame. This is particularly useful when you're shooting really light contrasty environments like sunrises or sunsets. Your camera holds more information in the shadow portion of the exposure than the highlights. In other words, you lose information in bright areas faster. So Nikon gives you a metering mode that will protect highlights. You go to highlight weighted metering when you have uh, really bright areas of the frame, sunrises and sunsets are good examples, and you can highlight meter off of the brightest point and it will build an exposure down from there. You might need to bring up shadows and midtones in post-production, but you will not risk losing as much highlight information. And that's the benefit of your highlight weighted metering. It's an option that a lot of landscape photographers forget they have at their disposal.
All right, so let's come out of the metering mode and we're gonna come here to view memory card info. This is just asking, what is the memory card doing? You can adjust these settings or what role is being played by the secondary memory card inside of the menu. This is just telling us what is happening. So we have two memory card slots inside of a Z5. And when I go into this, it says I'm recording into slot one and then it is set up for overflow. So after uh, number one fills, it will then overflow into memory card slot two. So that's what this is telling us. If I did not have a memory card set up in slot two, then it would be grayed out. So this is just giving us information about how the camera's operating. Coming out of there, we're gonna come over to vibration reduction. And this is the stabilization in the camera. And this would work in conjunction with stabilization in a lens if you have that. So we're gonna have three options and it defaults to just on. So vibration reduction is counterbalancing any shakiness that you might have while hand holding your camera. You can turn this off when the camera's on a tripod indicating to the camera that it does not need to attempt to stabilize because there is no camera movement and that can make your images sharper on a tripod. When you're hand holding, you want this on, but then we have a third option and it says SPT, which stands for sport. When you're shooting sports, you might be panning along with an athlete following a soccer player running across a field. And in those instances, we need to turn off the stabilizer in the direction of motion. So this turns off the horizontal stabilizer and keeps the vertical axis. So if you left the stabilizer on in the direction of motion while panning with a subject, it can blur your imagery. This uh, affects that issue and solves it. So if you're shooting wildlife or sports, anything where you're panning with the subject, you'll want to go to sport mode as opposed to just on. All right. So what things inside of here are the most useful to be taken out if you were to replace them? I would say image quality, JPEG size, and, and your memory card options, your memory card information, are the three that are gonna be least commonly utilized. Your memory card option only indicates what you've set up, and you probably will set up a memory card choice and never touch it again. You will hopefully be shooting raw imagery, so JPEG size is irrelevant, and we tend to select an image quality that we shoot for everything. In other words, it doesn't need to be changed regularly while shooting. Once you get really good at building exposures, you might, as I have, take metering mode out of contention as well. And that can free up either three or four slots to put in other things in the quick menu to make sure that you have at your fingertips exactly the tools that you want. If you want to know exactly what tools you might replace them with, we're going to have a video series that's going to explore the shooting menu, the video shooting menu, and then the custom settings menu of the Z5. So I hope to see you for those. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, enjoy your camera and we'll see you around. Thanks a lot.